Good morning. It's my pleasure to continue with you the series of nephrology update. Today, let us go through the update in a journal club. So I'll divide the presentation into four corners, uh, two slides on nephrology, followed by the most important for my, um, uh, for my perspectives regarding clinical nephrology, dialysis, and, the, and I'll end with fantastic few slides about nephropathology. Here, this is the slide that shows vascular calcification with the, within the aortic arch. And this is a method to evaluate the, um, the amount of calcification by looking at the arch uh, as this uh, 16 uh, slices. And here, calcification is evident in 6 out of 16. So this is the a scale of the vascular calcification. This is another slide showing the presence of aortic aneurysm by MRI. And here the IFC is completely occluded. And here all these are tributaries of the uh, systemic veins. The question is, uh, this is MRI, but gadolinium was not used in these slides. So the question, which type of contrast is used in this MRI? It is very interesting that Formoxitol, which is the form of parenteral iron, is used because it's high, it has a long half-life within the vascular tree. The question is, can we use formoxitol safely to diagnose any vascular problem in, by the use of MRA? Because formoxitol as IV iron can be used in dialysis patients without the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. This is a very interesting article. It discusses the issues of current and potential imaging applications of formic stall for ma magnetic resonance imaging, but we are st still waiting more evidence for the validity of using formic stall in this scenario. Regarding some uh, important nephrology publication, this is very interesting. Uh, hypertension risk in uh, the siblings uh, here, the mother, if the mother is uh, hypertensive during pregnancy, the risk of high blood pressure extends to all siblings born to this mother. And it's not restricted to the pregnancy uh, where hypertension is diagnosed. So if this is a pregnancy with hypertension, this uh, 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 sibling is affected. And this as well, uh, who comes from normal blood pressure pregnancy. So again, it's a very, a very interesting data, and this is a new that is published from the article, epidemiology article that was published in the Hypertension Journal, uh, Hypertension Pregnancy and of Spring Card Vascular Risk in Young Adulthood. Another interesting review that was published in the Nature Reviews of Nephrology, discussing the, the systemic nature of chronic kidney disease. Systemic uh, nature includes a lot of systems, and if you look here, there is a problem in the intestinal barrier and abnormal uh, and abnormal microbiome that leads to uh, uh, elaboration of uh, uremic toxin from intestine in the presence of uh, chronic kidney disease, uremic environment, and the retention of uremic toxin lead to cardiovascular problems. So in chronic kidney disease, there is a lot of problems in, within the intestine, cardiovascular, and inflammation. And this article addressed many, many issues regarding the systemic nature of chronic kidney disease. So I recommend all of you to read this article in details. This is a very important point. There is a difference between avacopan and eclizumab. Both of them target complement pathway, but eclizumab is a monoclonal antibody that inhibits the activation of complement 5 into 5A five and 5B, five uh, where avacoban is orally a drug, oral in a drug that targets the C5A receptor. It is C5A receptor inhibitor. Uh, so this study is a randomized trial of the use of this C5A receptor inhibitor, avacoban, in ankle associated vasculitis. Another interesting article in the ATI domain is the article that, that predicts uh, that is aiming for prediction of acute kidney injuries uh, in, a, in the intensive care unit. So risk of prediction is very important because if we, if we cannot predict, we cannot prevent the occurrence. This is by looking at many variables. These variables are 
categorized under chronic and acute. And he, here, this is the points of the score. If the patient has chronic kidney disease, the score is two. Chronic liver disease, two. Constant heart failure, hypertension, atherosclerotic. If the pH is less than uh, 7.3, this is a uh, three point score. Nephrotoxin exposure. Uh, severe infection, mechanical ventilation, anemia. So the total score, uh, the minimum is zero and the maximum is 21. And here the cutoff point for prediction is uh, five. So if the patient has five points from this score, this the patient is risky for acute kidney injury. And we need validation of all these uh, prediction models before uh, thinking of their usefulness. Regarding the Alice publication, one of the most important points in the uh, issue in Dallas is the ethical issue that was discussed with the article uh, published in the Lancet. And all these are principles where rationing, rationing dialysis resources necessary and unavoidable. Access dialysis should be equitable. Justice is very important in dealing with patients with chronic, kidney, chronic diseases. Physicians have an obligation to provide information about risks and the benefits of dialysis and to support patients or their surrogate decision makers in qualitative evaluation of treatment options. Decisions about initiation or withdrawal of dialysis shouldn't be considered irrevocable and we should rethink and even reconsider uh, the decision because in the future we have uh, other options that was not present while we are thinking of the initial decision. Policies and the guidelines governing access to dialysis should strive to avoid futile treatment, assure a minimum expected benefit threshold, promote equality of opportunity, maximize utility gains, exclude criteria that are not morally justifiable, ensure transparency of policies and the processes. Nephrologists should uh, refer patients to available services when they are unable to provide such care. Nephrologists should receive education about shared decision making. It is very important to think of how to uh, target, how to process the shared decision policies by sharing the patients in decision making because we are living in an era of patient-centered care to encourage advanced care planning and end-of-life counseling and communication about end-of-life care. Dallas providers should be trained in a clinical uh, uh, decision making conversation and developing multidisciplinary team approach, uh, collaborating with all uh, other specialities dealing with the patients and think of transplantation or supportive care. Dallas unit, unit should institute a process of second conversation, which will prepare the patient for future decline and serve as an optimal time for advanced care planning if the conservative care pathway is chosen. Another important point in the thinking of quality and safety assurance within the Dallas units is to think of root cause analysis. And this is one of the examples regarding the improving water quality in the Dallas units using root cause analysis, thinking of infection and the biofilm, and to look at the processes and the structures and here this slide shows the gaps and the contributing factors and how to intervene. Please fix this table and look at all, all gaps and the intervention for these gaps. And it's better to go uh, for the whole article within this journal because it is a very important point. Because safety in Dallas is very crucial, this is one of the questions within the first paper of MD nephrology, enumerate types and the benefits of safety the alarms within a dialysis machine because we should learn how to handle dialysis in a safe manner. Another important point that is uh, usually is usually neglected by the physician is to encourage exercise for patients with chronic kidney disease and even in dialysis population. And we should assess the fitness of the patients and advise the degree and the strength and intensity of exercise according to the patient's capacities, as you find here in these recommendations for aerobic resistance and flexibility in combining with aerobic and resistance when possible to encourage the patients for exercise for the uh, well-being of the patients and improving the many systems within the body.
Another important point is, does hepatitis B vaccine that we recommend in dialysis to be sure that the patient is immune against hepatitis B by developing a, a, a satisfactory titer against hepatitis B, is it safe or it, is, may be risk, it may be risky for increasing the risk of development of de novo anti HLA antibodies that may make future transplantation a difficult job? Here, this article that was published in Transplantation Immunology assures us that there is no correlation between hepatitis B vaccine and the future and the development of anti-HLA antibodies. We should follow our patients well, looking at fluid overload, because volume overload is bad and biomarker of mortality. Here, this study assessed more than 8,000 patients in hemodialysis patients uh, by looking at the bioimpedance to assess the blood volume, uh, to assess uh, the volume status, fluid status of the patient, and inflammation by looking at C-reactive protein. And this is not, was not restricted to only one point of time, but it was repeated. So we have first period evaluation and second period evaluation. The, more, the safest way is to have no overload so overload is negative in the first period and negative in the second period both fluid overload is not present and inflammation is absent so no no overload and no inflammation is associated with the best uh, here uh, best survival chances and the combination of full over volume overload and inflammation within well, the first period that persisted on the second period evaluation in the as is associated with the lowest survival and the highest hazards for mortality so again and again we should think of fluid overload and inflammation to avoid fluid overload and just be simple fluid overload equals the mortality and this is another study showing the same principle but looking at blood pressure plus overload here this is a study that included search line uh, incident hemodialysis patients in 26 countries using whole body bioimpedance spectroscopy with the blood pressure. Here, if the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure before dialysis is between 130 to 160 and there is no uh, fluid overload, this is the best survival. Hazard risks of mortality increases whenever we have volume overload, especially if blood pressure is low. Because here in this scenario, two scenarios, blood pressure is low, less than 130 before dialysis. Here there is high uh, volume overload, so the hazard increase to double, and here is normal. So again, this is a minimal or marginal or marginal increase. And here, blood pressure is above 160. There is no overload. It is one. Uh, the hazard risk is 1.18, but if there is volume overload, it increases to 1.6. Again and again, we should avoid fluid overload in dialysis patients. This study shows that in, interpreti in, in interpreting the results of mineral bond disorder profile like serum phosphorus PTH, we should look at uh, residual kidney function because here, if you are dealing with these patients with serum phosphorus less than 4 and there is a residual kidney function, the all cause mortality is reduced. But if the residual kidney function is uh, very low, is less than 1.5, here the mortality is there. And the correlation here is uh, deficient if there is uh, if serum phosphorus x7 or exceeding 7. The same with BTH. BTH is very low and there is um, sufficient residual kidney function, mortality is low. But if uh, BTH is very low and uh, residual kidney function is very low, less than 1.5 milli per minute, here the hazards uh, of mortality increased. And here you can find the difference is not uh, evident. So uh, we should think of residual kidney function. Another point in the clinical evaluation of our patients, we don't like sarcopenia, reduction in muscle mass, and we don't like fat, expansion of fat, obesity, because of both of them uh, are bad and associated with limitation of the uh, uh, physical activity here. You can look at the, if the, this is a control in the gray manner, and the black is the patients. Here, the situation of no sarcopenia, no obesity, no sarcopenia, but obesity, 
sarcopenia and obesity and sarcopenia and obesity as you see there is marked reduction of physical activity if both factors are present so both sarcopenia and obesities are bad here regarding the blood pressure and incident hemodialysis pre-dialysis blood pressure between above 130 is better than below 130 and this is drag our attention into raise our attention to the value of the blood pressure management in dialysis patients it should be completely different from chronic kidney disease because in chronic kidney disease with preserved some preservation of gfr we may think of intensive blood pressure control and intensive blood pressure control means using antihypersensitive treatment to reach to systolic blood pressure less than 120 millimeter mercury here in dialysis it's a very risky business why because intensive blood pressure lowering in hemodialysis patient is associated with many many adverse events including syncope falls reduced coronary perfusion uh, complications of drugs vessel access thrombosis accelerated loss of residual kidney function intradialytic hypotension failure to achieve dry body weight loss of con consciousness seizures a lot of problems uh, is associated with very low target blood pressure so this is why we don't consider the hemodialysis patient for the policy of intensive blood pressure lowering. Regarding atrial fibrillation, hemodialysis patient, uh, patients are completely different from general population. And whenever we think of using anticoagulation, we should address two risks. Risk for thromboembolism, which is shared vast risk. And these are, these are the components and the score point for each of them and has bled so the has bled is a, is a bleeding risk and the shared uh, vasc is the risk for thrombo thrombosis so to consider anticoagulation we should have higher high risk of shared vasc exceeding two and uh, has bled should, should be accepted less than uh, two less than three because of has bled is above three the risk of bleeding is there Again, again, and again, use of anticoagulation in dialysis is very difficult because we are afraid of from warfarin because of vascular calcification. Warfarin increases vascular dialysis, uh, calcification in dialysis patients, and it is difficult to adjust the dose to monitor INR. Even there is a, a paradoxical stroke, but this is a meta-analysis showed in these patients. Warfarin the risk of stroke and the bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation receiving dialysis. This is a systematic review of literature and meta-analysis of 14 observational studies, included 20,000 patients. Uh, this meta-analysis ended with a conclusion. There is no sufficient evidence for benefit or harm. So I'm not sure of the, uh, the issue. But the lesson is, whenever we think of warfarin and hemodialysis, we should discuss with the specialities and to reach the shared decision in these issues with the patients and to know the issues of vascular calcification and if we want to use uh, phosphate binder in this scenario when we think of non-calcium based phosphate binders this is a very interesting study including 14,000 patients here they correlate the use of warfarin atrial fibrillation and kidney function altogether looking at different uh, outcome parameters including uh, uh, combined uh, or cause death, stroke, and bleeding. Here, the blue line is reflecting warfarin users, and the red line, the control. Here, there is low risk, low comorbidities with warfarin, and even the bleeding, there is no difference between the uh, warfarin group and warfarin user or not. And here, according to the kidney function, here you can see the superiority. Here, the efficacy uh, the, is evident. To, uh, to reduce death and stroke and transient ischemic attack even in the low GFR less than 30 milli per minute and here you can find the bleeding risk here is not evident so it's very low it was these all groups and even here this is surprising that bleeding is higher in a patient with kidney function GFR between 60 to 90 so again we can use warfarin because the, there is a benefits of using Warfarin, when it's indicated in these patients, and to the extent that the editorial comment on this article uh, was issued under the title Warfarin, atrial fibrillation, CKD, effective and safe, but soon extinct. We are not sure if uh, because 
warfarin is, 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 can be monitored in these patients and the majority of physicians are acquainted with warfarin. Regarding coronary intervention, this study, this study addressed the issue, meta-analysis that addressed the issue of the comparison of drug eluted stents and repair metal stents in patients on dialysis. Uh, this study includes a large number of uh, participants, uh, 62,000, documenting the superiority of drug eluted stents in dialysis patients. But if I ask you a question, what is the best revascularization for dialysis patients up to this moment? We don't know, we are not sure if this cabbage operation or um, a stent uh, or a stenting. But it seems that it's better to follow step-wise approach to start with drug eluted stent whenever the vasculature uh, allows and then to think of cabbage as a second choice. Because yes, cabbage has a long, preferred long term, but on the short term, there is increasing mortality. And we are afraid of stenting from restenosis. So the wide, the, the wise step the care approach by starting with uh, drug eluted stent is superior to bare metal stent, and then we can think of cabbage later on. Sometimes it's very difficult to diagnose aortic stenosis in dialysis patients because the symptoms referred to as aortic stenosis may be uh, the common symptoms on dialysis patients and renal failure patients. So it needs the uh, uh, suspicion of the nephrologist by requesting echocardiogram to look at the vascular calcification. So another study showing that the use of drugs in dialysis patients uh, should be careful because here non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in this number of dialysis patients, uh, here there is association of non steroidal anti inflammatory drug use with stroke among the dialysis patients, so should avoid uh, the drugs as possible in dialysis patients. Regarding dialysate sodium, which is the best uh, value, and this study and this uh, article address the rationale for evaluation, evolution over time, and uh, the best is to look at the patient's serum sodium and to choose the best dialysate according to the patient's serum. Because if you select uh, dialysate sodium that is uh, significantly higher than the patient's serum, this will lead to increasing post hemodialysis serum sodium that will be followed by their sensation, intradialytic weight gain, volume expansion, hypertension, and in the same moment, because there is excess weight gain, you will find intradialytic hypotension, increasing sympathetic tone, and this will end with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiac structure change, increasing morbidity and mortality. In the same moment, if you select dialysate sodium that is quite lower than Serum sodium, this will lead to reduction of post hemodialysis serum sodium, redu reducing osmolality, leading to reduction of ultra filtration rate, myocardial ischemia, with consequent uh, hazards on the heart and increasing mortality and morbidity. So, it is very wise to individualize your prescription according to the patient's serum. You can allow dialysis sodium to be 2 millimole above uh, the, uh, the uh, serum sodium. Okay, regarding the incremental hemodialysis, this is the European perspectives. This, uh, these are the pro and the cons. Uh, here, the, uh, the balance is to look at all this together. Uh, so, the, uh, this is because this is a very important topic, we put a question on the MD exam about the prerequisites of incremental hemodialysis. Incremental hemodialysis means that we start dialysis and increasing the dose later on uh, or increasing frequency later on, so it is progressive dialysis. So to start with incremental dialysis, usually we start with twice weekly hemodialysis. We should be sure that there is adequate residual kidney function with urine output exceeding 600 milliliter per day and transition to thrice weekly if the urine drop is uh, if the urine output drops to less than 500 milli milliliter per day so we, sh we should look carefully at the urine volume uh, limited fluid retention the patient doesn't have overload between two consecutive hemodialysis treatment with fluid gain less than 2.5 kilogram or less 
than 5% of the ideal dry body weight without hemodialysis for three to four days. So we should look at the weight gain between dialysis sessions. Limited or readily manageable cardiovascular pulmonary symptoms. So the patient is nearly nearly asymptomatic. There is no uh, significant volume of fluid overload. Suitable body size relative to residual renal function. Patients with larger body size may be suitable for twice weekly hemodialysis if not hypercatabolic. Hyperkalemia, if potassium exceeding 5.5, infrequent or readily manageable. Uh, so absence of hyperkalemia, absence of hyperphosphatemia. Uh, good nutritional status should be present without uh, fluid, fluid hypercatabolic state. Lack of profound anemia. And frequent hospitalization is a manageable comorbid condition. Satisfactory health related quality of life and functional status, residual urea clearance exceeding 3 milli per minute. Uh, and uh, if it is reduced less than 2 milli per minute, this is an indication for transition to 3 uh, thrice weekly dialysis session. So, to start with the incremental dialysis, we should think of all the patient profile clinic examination, urine volume uh, measurement, uh, and thinking of uh, periodically for the residual kidney function evaluation. If there is marked uh, reduction of the uh, residual kidney function, uh, this is an indication to tran uh, for transition into three sessions. So to initiate twice, quick, twice weekly hemodialysis, the patient should meet the first urine output uh, exceeding 600 milliliter, and the last criteria a residual uh, urea clearance exceeding 3 milli per minute plus most 5 out of 9 other criteria. So this is the strategy. Examine these criteria every 1 to 3 months in all twice weekly hemodialysis patients and compare outcome measure between twice weekly and thrice weekly hemodialysis patients to assure outcome non-inferiority for continuation of twice weekly hemodialysis. Consider transition from twice weekly to three weekly Thrice weekly dialysis regimen, a patient urine output drops less than 5 milli, 500 milliliter per day. Residual uh, uh, urea clearance less than 2 milli per minute per uh, average adult surface area. A patient nutrition status or general health condition uh, shows a deterioration uh, trend, treating trend over time. So this is the uh, parameter that should be uh, logged at, and this is the implementation strategy. If there is a difference between and superiority of the online hemodial filtration, uh, this is a study which is known as uh, French, and the French means the uh, French convective versus hemodialysis in elderly because it compares online hemodial filtration versus high flux dialysis hemodialysis. This study showed no difference in quality of life, morbidity, and mortality. Although, in conclusion, they showed some superiority of the online hemodial filtration, but up to this point, we are not convinced by this superiority, and we are looking for forward for, many, for other studies. Anemia management. Anemia management is very essential in dialysis patients, and uh, here we should not forget use iron, because iron is very crucial. Regarding renal replacement therapy in critically ill patients with acute kidney injury, we should uh, read this article because it's very interesting. Because it discusses strategies for optimal timing to start renal replacement therapy in critically ill patients and acute kidney injury. And here, these are the absolute indications in the absence of contraindication for renal replacement therapy. Refractory hyperkalemia, exceeding 6.5, uh, refractory acidemia, and the metabolic acidosis pH is less than 7.2, refractive pulmonary edema, symptoms or complications attributable to uremia like bleeding, bricardizing, encephalopathy, overdose toxicity from a dialyzable drug and toxin. All these are indications in acute kidney injury environment. Relative indication, the absence of life-threatening complication included limited uh, physiological reserve, advanced uh, non-renal organ dysfunction, worsened or exacerbated by excessive uh, fluid accumulation, like impaired respiratory function, antiplatelets, um, anticipated solute burden, tumor lysis, rhabdomolysis, intravascular hemolysis, need for larger volume fluid administration, severity of underlying disease, concomitant accumulation of uh, poisons, 
or toxic drugs that can be removed by RRT like salicylate, acylene glycol, uh, methanol, metformin. Relative contraindication, fetal prognosis, patient receiving palliative care, high likelihood of non-recovery of renal function in patient who is not a candidate for long-term dialysis. So we should think of all these together to decide the uh, when to start. And here, these are the benefits and drawbacks of earlier RRT in the absence of conventional indication among critically ill patients with acute kidney injury. So the, the benefits of early start of rehabilitation therapy within the acute kidney injury domain is avoidance and early control of fluid accumulation, avoidance and or earlier control of acid-base derangement, avoidance and or earlier control of electrolyte and metabolic derangement, avoidance and or earlier control of complication, avoidance of unnecessary or excessive diuretic exposure, immunomodulation and the clearance of inflammatory mediators, unloading or resting uh, stressed and or damaged kidneys. But the drawbacks are need for an, uh, and the complication of the dialysis catheter insertion, risk of atrogenic episodes of hemodynamic instability, etc. So there are benefits and drawbacks. And myself, I'm preferring the indicated uh, indications to start rather than to start the earlier dialysis in patients with acute kidney injury. These are the summary of clinical practice guidelines for starting RRT in critical ill patients. This is the Kidigo guidelines and shit RRT emergently when life threatening and chains like fluid and electrolyte acid base disorders are present. Consider the broader clinical context, the presence of condition that can be modified with RRT and a trend of laboratory tests rather than single BN and creating thresholds alone when making the decision to start RRT. You can read in detail the National Institute for Health and Care uh, Advices and French Intensive Care Society and myself, uh, I am very convinced by doing dialysis whenever it is necessary for the patient. And this is a wise approach. If we are dealing with acute kidney injury, if there uh, present of life threatening complications of EKI, uh, medically refractory and not uh, reverse it quickly by medical management here, start RRT. If no, you can follow this approach to um, that can guide you for the best timing of start renal replacement therapy. To end this presentation, I'll go to the pathology slides. So this is one of the slides of Professor Helmut Rinke. And this is the scanning electron microscope shown. This is the uh, capillary from inside, from this is in the cilial fenestration. So this is a very fantastic slide. And this is the from outside. This is the bodocyte. And here you can find the primary branching, secondary branching, and tertiary branching. So this is a unique, although it is unique and fantastic, it is terminally differentiated. And this cell bodocyte lacks proliferation capacity. So if it damages it, it is not for repair. And this is the capillary wall, and this is a lumen. So this is endothelial cell, and this is the endothelial layer of endothelium. And here, this is a piece membrane with three layers, lamina rara interna, densa, and externa. And this is the epithelial cell with photoporosis. So this is a normal uh, electromicroscope appearance of the capillary loop. If you compare the, uh, this one with this appearance, with that with this one, you can find here fusion of food process. So this is the patient with minimal change disease. Everything is normal by light microscope, but the, the, the salient fissure is fusion of food process. This is a very interesting paper that discusses the issue of crystal uh, nephropathies. And the crystal nephropathies, according to this review that was published in April, in the initial reviews of nephrology are divided into three categories. Vascular, here this is the second vessel by, uh, close, uh, by crystals, and here this is the consequences of uh, uh, fibrosis, hyaline class, so this is the consequence of the uh, effect of uh, arterial narrowing, and this is the classic 
atherombolic renal disease and you can find this is a vessel occluded and this is the crystal of the cholesterol because cholesterol, and when cholesterol is solved with preservation it leaves this is cleft so this is cholesterol cleft syndrome or atherombolic renal disease and this is a cocktail of phenomena here you can find the uh, bile uh, cast this is the oxalosis in a case of a ceiling like cold toxicity and this is myoglobin in a case of rhabdomyolysis, multiple myeloma, and here crystal within the hepatocytopathy. So again and again, crystal nephropathies are divided into vascular, nephron, and urothelial to, to um, know the mechanism of toxicity of this crystal. Please go ahead and read in detail this fantastic article. I want to end this journal club with Mahatma Gandhi. A statement live as if you were to die tomorrow learn as if you were to live forever so this is my call everyone should read especially doctors should read until their death and it's not only to read but also to follow up your patients by on close in close follow-up because as William Osler stated he who studies medicine without books sells an uncharted see see this is not known for him uh, so he doesn't the, the here the doctor is not knowing his pathway so we should read 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 but reading is not enough alone we should read and practice medicine because uh, uh, he who studies medicine without patience doesn't go to see at all so medicine is knowledge attitude and practice thank you very much and i'll hope that you'll find in within this presentation interesting data for you and i'll be happy if you send it to my email your question goodbye